There's about 150 acres of irrigated cropland on the teller, and this particular field here is called Slack One, and we pretty much uh, have planted barley in it the last couple of years. We'll probably transfer it over to alfalfa here in a year or two, and then kind of keep that rotation going. On both edges of it, we plant corn, just essentially for a little diversity and travel corridors for pheasants and deer and things. Uh, as you can see when we drive in, the north uh, corridor of corn is completely blitzed. The deer just utilize it 100%. I mean, they just eat it. If you look here where the, the strips are um, harvested, combined about four widths, and then we leave three of standing barley. And what's interesting here is this barley will not get utilized till about December. There's lots of waterfowl around, but they're just not field feeding yet in the standing sense of barley. If you harvested the whole thing, there'd be some geese in here and ducks probably following them in. But they're really not hitting the field barley until, you know, December and by January there's, there's 5,000 mallards utilizing these standing barley. And they eat it within about three weeks. It's gone. I actually did a, a, a little study once on how many cups of barley uh, an adult mallard eats mm -hmm. and how many ducks can we sustain here and, and for a period of time. And it actually came out pretty close to about three weeks of 5,000. Nice. And I thought, that's good. I guess we're growing it. So we want to grow more. Um, then the field to the west is where we have some perennial grasses, some native, some not, and then rotating strips of barley. With On the south end, we have the two little canola plots. And then we also have the pheasant brood strips in that field. And those pheasant brood strips are just designed to provide saturated, moist soil for chicks to eat insects off of for the first say eight weeks of their life. And, and research has showed that the pheasant hens will stay within this zone where the chicks are largely feeding on, on insects and she doesn't have to take them around to other places to try to find that forage site. And, and as a result, the chicks don't get picked off as readily. Um, our brood counts went up from the first year that I did them was about four chicks per adult hen in an August survey to nine chicks per adult hen. And last year, uh, this August, we had the same count. Um, unfortunately, the wet spring this year, as you know, had some per pretty dramatic impacts on chick survival. They just don't have the contour feathers to stay warm, and, and we lost a lot of chicks. This, this was a project we did in 2008. This field to the south of us here was largely weeds. And this was a small little drainage ditch coming out of here, which is partially spring fed, but has some runoff from Willow Creek. And we had a water right tied to this wetland over here that would allow us to back this water up if you had a control structure in here. So we installed this uh, uh, camera, canal check it's called, and then basically rehydrated this 26 acre wetland and as you can see, the cattail and sedges uh, have really come back and dominated this area now. So, I mean, essentially there's a few musk thistle and a few weeds and some uplands, but it's come back. Then we came in and excavated small little polygons out in the cattail mats, removed the tubers so there's an open water component out in this wetland complex. There's five small open water components, each of which this year produced a brood or two. And so, I mean, just a very successful project all the way down to that large willow tree. This control structure impacts the hydrology. It, it, all of this behind you, which is the, the uh, juncus, that was all Canadian thistle and houndstone. And now it's, you know, wetland plants. That, that whole area got saturated. And uh, so a real success of what you can do just by manipulating the, you know, and controlling your water. One, Here's an Aspen exclosure we saw uh, earlier this this year. Looks good with the leaves on the trees. Yeah, this was an abandoned gravel pond where they probably extracted gravel to do some of the road work. And uh, we had a water right associated to it. Uh, well, why don't we restore this into a little more habitat? 
And so we basically created a deep end, kind of a lacustrine component at the north end of this thing with uh, a fisheries, there's trout in there. And then we designed it to have a deep channel that comes all the way up to where the water enters, uh, kind of a meandering channel, and then created the islands. And then you see the bulrush clumps in there. Everything else is gravel, but we kept uh, loads of good organic you know, soil, dirt, in certain areas and then just planted the bulrush, just tubers from areas on the refuge. And as you can see, it just from a shovel load, each one of those clumps is really prosperous. And now we got, you know, blackbirds nesting in it, waterfowl are utilizing the seed source. And the islands, uh, every year there's waterfowl nesting on those, even though man-made waterfowl islands are something of the past, they utilize them. This, this is a, a electric fence that we put up in 2007, and it's, it's a company called Electro Braid out of Canada. One of the real benefits to it is it's real elastic. In fact, you can see some of the tree blow down we had this year. Um, tree falls right on it. We cut the tree up, the fence pops right back. It's solar panel in the back, 9,000 volts. If you touch this one here, it'll make you say bad things. Grab it. You know, the whole idea of this is to educate ungulates and humans as well. And, uh, but um, the high school class from Corvallis came out here last year and did a transect. We did two transects in and two transects out um, where they counted cottonwoods um, within a 12 foot uh, uh, width. And inside they had uh, like 116 trees averaging 23 inches tall and outside they had like nine trees averaging four inches tall. And if you look around out here, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. There's there's no uh, regeneration. There's no growth of young cottonwoods, aspens to speak of. So inside, it's uh, going on its fourth full summer. Um, pretty dramatic. If you look at the north end of this thing, where the alders have really responded. And, you know, I mean, most of us don't think that alders are going to be impacted by deer. Well, obviously they are. The alder component has really come back. Unexpected results, knapweed. Knapweed inside is three to four feet tall. Look at out here. So deer obviously browse on that particular weed. And uh, there's bird surveys being done in here as well that have probably not, it's too early in the game to really show a, a difference, but some of the preliminary results show that there's increased diversity inside and numbers versus the outside control. And so we're going we're gonna to leave this thing up for another three years before we think about moving it. And it is movable. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, a thing that you can take down uh, by unscrewing the corner posts and rolling up the wires and moving it to another site. Okay, this was the Gird Creek Restoration Project. It was completed in May of 2008. And, and, and essentially, if you look at this from this bank over to the far bank, um, which was about, you know, 50 to 60 feet wide and go south all the way a quarter of a mile. That's what this thing looked like. It was a straight line. There was no curvature, sinuosity, uh, no point bars, back bays, very little pooling habitat and, and riffles and glides and spawning gravels, things like that. Um, we hired a consultant to come in and, and design the restoration and, and within, well, 30 or 40 days of pretty much continuous work, they've completed this project. All these point bars were, you know, man-made. And so we put those in there. The way the system was designed was to have a pool, a riffle, and a glide. And it, it, it was designed to move the sediments through the system and then a, a process known as a helical flow, which distributes the sediments onto the opposite side of the point bar and mimics kind of a natural flood event where you get cottonwood seedlings, willow seedlings, sedges, and things like that. This thing has recovered, um, I mean, dramatically. You can't really tell other than I'm telling you that we came in here and did this, that this was a man-made project just a couple years ago. Um, the high school, again, does studies in here with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. The, the response in, in trout species, uh, abundance and size coming back into this system from the main stem of the Bitterroot 
has been pretty impressive. So uh, build it, restore it, and, and the fish are obviously benefiting from it. And a side note, all these little point bars and back bays are just outstanding brood habitat for waterfowl, hooded mergansers, wood ducks that are down here in the bottom. So this is a real success. This is a you know created point bar. You can see where we put the alders actually that were here back in. And then and, and look at the narrowness of this channel compared to when it opens up down here. That's that neighboring property that we'd love to acquire someday. Um, you look at the width of the creek, so those velocities slow down dramatically, the sediments deposit, a lot more aquatic vegetation, you know, spawning beds are almost non-existent. So those fish are coming up into this system because the habitat's obviously there that they prefer. But this whole point bar going out to the fence line was, was put in here. So this project we just finished this February, I think Paul got to see it in May. So it probably hadn't had a chance to really recover and show the uh, the growth. We have seven monitoring wells out in this field. And for over a year, we measured the water depth of the groundwater table out here and found that this area had probably the closest to the surface of this whole 40 acres. It was about six inches below the surface. So we came out here and GPS this polygon, irregular shape, kind of making it look like a natural little hemi marsh, and came out here in February with excavators and, and excavated it and took off, you know, 18 inches upwards. The deepest thing in here is about three feet deep. We didn't want to pop the pan. Once we hit gravel, we stopped and we kept a nice soil base in the bottom of this so emergent vegetation would slowly come back into this, which you can see bulrush and sedge. And you can see the shallow, uh, the, the little mud flats too that aren't inundated with water, just incredible shorebird habitat. We've had four different species of shorebirds that we haven't seen here on the teller show up this year. And we took the spoils and moved them north to an area that had less, let's just say, less desirable soils and then reseeded those and it really responded because of the rains we had. And then we introduced three different shrub species out here. The, the woody component of browse out here is lacking in this field. So we put snowberry, woods rose, and golden currant out on the spoil sites. And you can see those fenced areas out here to the north. Um, they all responded really well. And as far as escape cover for things like pheasants in the winter, when that it gets established, that's where they're going to go into that woody vegetation so the marsh hawks and, and uh, rough leggers can't hit them. So anyway, Paul saw this in May. It probably didn't look very good, mm -hmm. uh, but this is you know one That's one season, great. one yeah, season. For one, because it was you were just getting started.